Today we're going to talk about equilibrium point analysis and the technique we're going to use is called linearization. I will introduce this through one specific example and that is going to be the following uh, system of equations. dx over dt is going to be 2x times 1 minus x over 2 minus xy and dy over dt is 3y times 1 minus y over 3 minus 2xy. A system like this is sometimes called a competing species system. You think of x and y as separate species. Uh, x starts with the assumption of uh, exponential growth here with the 2x term, but then this term introduces some carrying capacity, right? As soon as x is bigger than 2, this term flips to negative and we get, instead of growth, decay. So that would, be, that would be a logistic model for x. But then we have this extra term which says the presence of y also makes x grow less uh, quickly. And then a similar thing happens for y here. We have this exponential growth, a logistic term meant to signify some carrying capacity. And then here, the existence of x's will be a drag on y's growth. Now, in general, this system is, is too difficult to solve with analytic methods, um, in part because this system is nonlinear. All the systems we've looked at before have been linear systems, but this one is nonlinear. What I mean by that is we have x times y here. That is a nonlinear term. We have x times x, so there's really an x squared hidden in here. That's a nonlinear term. But what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, equilibrium points of this system to figure out what the general overall behavior of the system is. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite these equations to make it easier to find the equilibrium points. So dx d over dt, I'm going to instead write as x times 2 minus x minus y and dy over dt, I'm going to write as y times 3 minus y minus 2x. All right, uh, I've rewritten them this way because now it's a little bit easier to figure out what the equilibrium points are. Uh, one equilibrium point is definitely 0, 0. When x and y are both 0, we see that dx over dt equals 0 and dy over dt equals 0. So if we start at 0, 0, we stay at 0, 0. Uh, another equilibrium point, let's see what happens here. What if we let y be 0, right? Then that automatically zeroes out dy over dt. Then we just need dx over dt to be 0. And one way we could do that when y equals 0 is to let x equal 2. Uh, now let's let x equal 0 and figure out what y needs to be. If x is 0, then this one is automatically equal to 0, so we're fine there. We just need this to be equal to 0, which would happen when x is 0 if y is equal to 3. So 0, 3 is another equilibrium point. And then there's one equilibrium point where both x and y are not 0. That's when x and y are both 1. Right. We can see that's fine. We find this equilibrium point by looking at this part here and this part here. This 2x, 2 minus x minus y and 3 minus y minus 2x. When we solve those two simultaneously, we get x and y to be 1. Okay, so those are our equilibrium points. So how are we going to use these equilibrium points to figure out what's going on? Well, the trick here is to go back and think about something from calculus. Recall from calculus that when 
x is pretty close to zero, uh, the functions x and sine of x are very similar. Right, they both are equal to zero at zero. And for at least small values of x, both positive and negative, small values of x, the func the, the graph of sine x looks very much like the graph of x. Right? Um, and perhaps for some purposes, depending on what you're doing with the function sine x, it may not matter whether you choose to look at the full function sine x or just the function x. The reason this works is because these functions have the same value at x equals 0, and they have the same derivative at x equals 0. Right? This derivative of sine x is cosine x, and cosine at 0 is 1. So both of these functions have the same derivative at 0. So that's essentially what we're going to do. We're going to use the functions that are closest to these functions at the equilibrium points, but they're not going to be nonlinear functions. They're not going to have x times x or x times y. They're just going to be purely linear functions. Okay, so let's clear the slide here and figure out how to do that. I'm going to write the equations over again, and they're going to look slightly different, but the reason why I'm writing them this way is they could be more suited to our purposes. Uh, dx over dt was 2x minus x squared minus xy, and dy over dt is 3y minus y squared minus 2xy. So this function, let's call this function f. It's a function of two variables. And the second equation, let's call that function g, which is also a function of two variables. Okay. So the question is, how do we find the functions that are linear but as close as possible to these, these uh, equations here? And the secret to this, or the trick to this, is we look at something called the Jacobian matrix. And for this system, the Jacobian matrix looks like this. In the first term, we put the partial of f with respect to x. Second term in the first row, we put the partial of f with respect to y. The second row's first term is the partial of g with respect to x. And the second term in the second row is the partial of g with respect to y. So let's do that with these functions f and g here. So right here I put the x partial of the function f which is going to be 2 minus 2x minus y. Over here, I put the y partial, which is just minus x. Over here, I put the y, or sorry, the x partial of the function g, which is just negative 2y. And here, I put the y partial of the function g, which is 3 minus 2y minus 2x. Okay, So now we have the Jacobian matrix. Now what we do is we calculate what the Jacobian matrix is at each of the equilibrium points. So we need 0, 0. Another equilibrium point was 2, 0. We had 0, 3 and the equilibrium point 1, 1. 
At 0, 0, we plug in 0 for x and 0 for y. We get the matrix 2, 0, 0, 3. At this matrix, or at the point 2, 0, we get the matrix minus 2, minus 2, 0, minus 3. At 0, 3, we get the matrix minus 1, 0, 6, minus 3. And at the point 1, 1, we get the matrix negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1. All right, great. So these are now the linearized systems at each of the equilibrium points. So these matrices are the matrices which come from uh, the linearized system, right? And so now what we do is we take a look at each of these four matrices and we calculate what the eigenvalues are for them to figure out what's going on at each of these different equilibrium points. Right? So here, it's not too hard to see this. These eigenvalues are 2 and 3. Here, the eigenvalues, I've calculated them. I'm not going to calculate them here. We've done that plenty of times, but I've calculated them, and they are negative 2 and negative 3. For this one, the eigenvalues are negative 3 and negative 1. And for this last one, the eigenvalues are negative 1 plus or minus root 2. Okay, so those are our eigenvalues. But we don't need to figure out all the eigenvectors here. We, we can just start by saying some things right now. Okay, at 0, 0, the eigenvalues are 2 and 3, so 0, 0 is a source. At the equilibrium point 2, 0, both eigenvalues are negative, so that equilibrium point is a sink. At the equilibrium point 0, 3, both of the eigenvalues are negative, so that is a sink as well. And here, one of these eigenvalues is positive, and one of them is negative, so this is a saddle. Okay, so we have a source at the origin. We have two sinks, one at 2, 0, one at 0, 3, and a saddle at 1, 1. So let's look at the phase portrait here and kind of imagine what's going on. So let's see, one, two. So there's an equilibrium point. There's the equilibrium point zero three. We have the equilibrium point at the origin and we have an equilibrium point here. Okay, now we're gonna draw some arrows to, to signify what we have going on here. Recall that at zero, zero, we saw we had a source, and I'm only gonna plot positive values for x and y here, because this is a population model. So this is a source, so all solutions are gonna move away from this equilibrium point, at least for a small period of time. Here, we had a sink. At three, 0, 3, we have a sink. So all solutions are going to move towards this sink when we're, they're close to it. And this was a sink as well. So all solutions that are close to the point 2, 0 are going to move towards the point 2, 0 because it's a sink. The question is, what's going on at 1, 1? Right? There, we had a saddle. We had one eigenvalue is negative 1 minus root 2, and the other eigenvalue is negative 1 plus root 2. So in one direction, we're going to be pulled towards the equilibrium point. In another direction, we're going to be pushed away from the equilibrium point because this one is negative, 
and this one is possible. So to figure out how this works, we're going to actually have to get the eigenvectors as well. So let me write down what the eigenvector is for these. So for negative 1 minus root 2, the eigenvector is 1 over root 2, 1. And for negative 1 plus root 2, the eigenvector is negative 1 over root 2, 1. Okay, so this is, right, 0 0.707 comma 1. Uh, so I'm going to draw a line that kind of has that slope. And this one has the uh, opposite slope here. Okay, so this first line that I drew represents this eigenvector, and that's a negative eigenvalue. So along this line, we're going to get pulled towards this equilibrium point. But then on the other line, we have a positive eigenvalue, so we're going to be pushed away. So it's important at those saddles to figure out what directions pull towards and what directions pull away. But now that we have these arrows here, we can kind of draw in what's going to happen, right? So we're going to be pulled towards this nice little equilibrium point only along one line, but then otherwise we're getting pulled away towards these other equilibrium points. So I'm just drawing in other arrows to represent what we have here. Okay. So what we've done is we've used the fact that we had four equilibrium points. We linearized the system at each of those equilibrium points. And we looked at whether we have sources, sinks, or saddles at those points. And then we use that information to draw a pretty good phase portrait for the system. Now let me show you a, a, a nicer picture of the phase portrait for this system right here. And here's the point 1, 1, the nice equilibrium point we were talking about. And we see that we're getting pulled towards that point along one line over here, along one line over here. But otherwise, we get pulled towards these other equilibrium points. And this picture is very reminiscent of the picture that we just drew. Okay, so what this equilibrium point analysis does, is it allows us to take more difficult systems that we can't find solutions for, but kind of figure out what the phase portrait of those systems is going to look like. There's one big problem, though, with this equilibrium point analysis to be careful for. It doesn't work if one of two things happens. If the eigenvalue are purely imaginary. If you have a purely imaginary eigenvalue, then you have a center, and this equilibrium point analysis will not work. And the other case where this equilibrium point analysis will not work to tell you how this system behaves is if zero is an eigenvalue. But aside from that, we can use this equilibrium point analysis, this linearization, to figure out the behavior, or the qualitative behavior, of more complex systems than just linear systems.